Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. Welcome to the uh, SNA Heritage Night. Um, first, I want to thank Raytheon for sponsoring this event and uh, the lovely uh, food setup that we have in the room, and, uh, and thank all the guests that have come tonight. Uh, we also have down on this front table a cake that was made in honor of all the Coast Guard and Navy sailors that have served in Vietnam. So after the event tonight, if you'd like to come up and get a, a piece of that, we'd uh, welcome you. So in seeking our topic for this year's symposium, we didn't need to spend much time thinking of the main focus since this is the 50th anniversary of the Navy and Coast Guard participation in the naval action in Vietnam. I know many of my peers are not as familiar with our Navy's role in this primarily brown water action, but it seems history is repeating itself as it usually does, and we find ourselves once again interested in the techniques, tactics, and challenges of a brown water or a littoral Navy. We are very lucky tonight to have some true subject matter experts who, are, who were there fighting a new type of enemy in extremely difficult circumstances with, with evolving weapon systems and somewhat difficult allies. Our distinguished panel will discuss Operation Mark Time, which was established by the Joint Chiefs of Staff after the 1965 Vung Ro incident to blockade the vast South Vietnam coastline against North Vietnamese gun running trawlers carrying troops and supplies. A tight security and surveillance system was necessary. This would be no easy chore with a 1,200 mile coastline and over 60,000 junks and sandpans to control. To provide the coverage needed, the Coastal Surveillance Force was established in March of 1965 called Market Time after the native boats using the waterways for fishing and marketing. This task force provided a single command to integrate sea, air, and land-based units and to coordinate U.S. Navy and Coast Guard and South Vietnamese naval units. Market Time units stopped many enemy vessels carrying supplies and men. The success of the operation forced the enemy to rely on the Ho Chi Minh Trail to support to transport supplies. As many of the trawler kills were in the southern Vietnam area near the Cao Mau Peninsula, the enemy had to carry supplies over an extraordinary long distance. Dr. Sherwood will lead our discussion tonight with, an, with our honored panel of veteran warfighters. Please allow me to introduce the panel before we get started. Dr. Sherwood has served as a historian with the Naval History and Heritage Command since 1997. He holds a PhD in history from the George Washington University and has authored six books, including War in the Shallows, U.S. Navy Coastal and Riverine Warfare in Vietnam, 1965 to 1968. Thank you, Dr. Sherwood, for dedicating your time and effort for the SNA's heritage tonight. The Reverend Stephen Ulmer is a native of Miami, Florida, graduated with honors from the United States Coast Guard in 1963. In his brief Coast Guard career, he served aboard the Coast Guard Cutter Ingham in Norfolk, Virginia, Squadron One, Vietnam, and he was the CEO of the Coast Guard base in Mayport, Florida. In Squadron One, he served first as the XO of Point Gammon in Da Nang, and then Ops Officer of Division 12, and finally CEO of Point Lee, Cat Low. He was in the very first group of Coasties to go to Vietnam in 1965, and he extended his tour to stay 18 months. And serving as the uh, CEO of the, Goose Guard, uh, the Coast Guard Gunner Point League, Coast Guard Squadron One, to interdict Viet Cong infiltration attempts near the mouth of the Cho Chen River on June 20th, 1966. While CEO of Point League in 1966 had captured intact a steel hull gun running ship that sailed from North Vietnam to supply the Viet Cong. He was subsequently awarded the Silver Star and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. This was the first enemy steel hull vessel captured intact during the Vietnam War. The story of this incident is recorded in three books that include the Coast Guard in Vietnam, Point League Drive, one of the streets at the Academy, was named after the boat he commanded for its contribution to the effort in Vietnam. For his service in Vietnam, the Reverend Ulmer was inducted into the U.S. Coast Guard Wall of Gallantry in 2009. Captain Arthur P. Ismay graduated from the Naval Academy in 1951. His first tour was in destroyers during the Korean War followed by tours as executive officer and commanding officer in minesweepers and tours as executive officer in a radar picket and assistance plans officer in a carrier division staff. Captain Ismay served as the commander of Coastal Squadron 1 from 1965 to 1966. 
His command consisted of 84 swift boats, three experimental, experimental patrol air cushion vehicles, and over 750 men. Coastal Squadron 1 played an influential role in Operation Market Time patrolling the Vietnam waterways. Vice Admiral David Robinson is a native of Texas and attended Texas A&M University before entering the United States Naval Academy. His first, he first went to sea in USS Storms as a main propulsion assistant and then damage control assistant. This tour was followed by a tour as engineer officer in USS Rowan. Subsequently, he was executive officer in USS Dale. His sea commands were USS Cannon, PG-90, USS Reddy, USS Luce, USS Richmond K. Turner, and Commander Cruiser Destroyer Group 8 embarked in USS Theodore Roosevelt. While commanding Cannon during operations in Vietnam on 11 August 1970, then Lieutenant Commander Robinson was awarded the Navy Cross in the Bow Day River when his ship came under intense enemy automatic weapons, rocket, and small arms attack from a 40-man force on both sides of the river. During the initial hail of enemy fire, Lieutenant Commander Robinson sustained a broken leg and numerous shrapnel wounds when a rocket exploded on the port side of the bridge. Despite his serious wounds and loss of blood, he continued to direct his ship's fire until the enemy attack was suppressed. Refusing medical evacuation, Lieutenant Commander Robinson requested that he be strapped to a stretcher and placed in an upright position to that he could contribute to direct actions of his ship until clear of the enemy ambush. I'd like to again thank our uh, panelists for coming tonight, and I'd like to now turn over to Dr. Sherwood, who's going to give his presentation. Thank you, Dave. My name is John Sherwood. I'm with the Naval History and Heritage Command, and tonight I'm going to provide an overview of Operation Market Time, the U.S. Navy's Coastal Surveillance Force in Vietnam. After I give my presentation, we'll hear deck plate perspectives on market time from our distinguished panel of veterans. The origins of market time stretch back to the advisory period, uh, where the Navy sent advisors to Vietnam. This, this ran from 1950 to 1965. This image shows a, a junk and yes, those are sails. This was a sailing junk. Uh, it was a command junk, uh, and it's dated 1964, and there are several naval advisors on the junk. Advisors were sent over to assist in the development of the fledgling VNN, the Vietnam Navy. The VNN had three components, a coastal force, a river force, and a sea force. The coastal force was a militia type unit that, uh, that deployed junks, both motorized and sailing junks. They were mainly in charge of protecting the coast from infiltration. There was a river force which engaged in riverine assaults, uh, river, uh, was involved in river patrols, and also provided logistic services for the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And finally, the Sea Force, which was sort of a green, quasi-blue water force consisting of larger gunboats, uh, a few LSTs, and, and, uh, and minesweepers. By 1965, the VNN consisted of eight, over 8,000 personnel. Advisors, and this is a, this is a picture of of Dale Meyercord, there was a, a frigate named after him. Uh, people like Meyercord operated under the most difficult conditions imaginable. Uh, they, they saw combat regularly, they went home to their bases, and their bases were shelled. They ate Vietnamese food uh, and ended up with uh, amoebic dysentery. Uh, it was a very, very tough job. They lived in isolation uh, with, with a group of people who did not speak English. Uh, despite their hard work, they were not able to turn the VNN into a truly effective fighting force. Uh, the problems of the VNN were many, but the main problems were poor morale in the enlisted force, which was caused by low pay and deplorable living, living conditions. 
in many cases, the VNN were lucky to get paid in general. Uh, payrolls were often not met. Uh, there was a young, inexperienced officer corps that suffered from the politicization of the, of the Vietnamese armed forces. Naval officers during this period were, were trained in two places. The first crop of VNN naval officers were trained in France at the, at the Naval Academy in Brest. Uh, VNN then set up its own Naval Academy at Nha Trang. Uh, inadequate maintenance was another problem. And finally, U.S. Naval, Navy advisors are also partly to blame, not the advisors, the advisors themselves, but the Navy for not giving them proper language and cultural training going into Vietnam. Many had, had only a few weeks of Vietnamese before, before being sent over. I, I, one of the, the catalysts for the Navy, the U.S. Navy's eventual involvement in Vietnam was Vung Ro, as Dave, the Vung Ro Bay incident, as Dave mentioned, but also the assassination of a brilliant young CNO, Ho Tan Kuen. Uh, he was politically linked to the Diem government and he was killed by one of his own officers, a member of his own wardroom, a lieutenant commander. This absolutely shattered the very tight-knit, small officer group, officer corps of the VNN, and they were never able to recover from that. Uh, there, were, there were divisions based on religion. There were divisions based on north and south, where people came from. There were divisions based on component force, uh, sea force versus river force, et cetera. The Vung Ro Bay incident in 1965 uh, was, was it, what happened there is a, a 130-foot steel-hulled freighter was seized by the Viet, VNN. Uh, it was initially spotted not by the VNN, but, but by a U.S. helicopter, and it took the VNN over four days to, to, to capture and secure the war supplies on that ship. For the Navy, it revealed two things. Uh, it revealed that wooden junks and sailing junks were no match against steel-hulled freighters armed with larger caliber weapons. Um, the Navy actually sent an officer over there, a, a man named Art Bucklew, who concluded that the personnel in the Coastal Force were by and large illiterate, operating under the most difficult conditions on an extremely austere basis. For coastal interdiction, the U.S. Navy had to offer something that the VNN didn't have. Modern ships equipped with the latest technology, along with a highly trained and motivated group of officers and sailors. Navy entered initially not as market time, but as TF-71. So TF-71, it reported not, it didn't report up through MACV, in Saigon, but reported to 7th Fleet. And here's a picture of Jenkins DD-447, uh, which, which participated in some of these initial patrols. Uh, what TF-71 did was it patrolled the 17th parallel, which is a 40-mile long stretch of water, and it also patrolled eight sectors along the Vietnamese coast. The rules of engagement at this time uh, allowed for American ships to only detect infiltrators. It would be up to the VNN to actually intercept and seize uh, contraband goods. Market time was established in April of 1965, and it, it took, a, it took a, a more holistic approach to interdiction. It established a, a three-barrier system of blockade and eventually 5,000 personnel and 126 craft were deployed. The rules of engagement were also changed to allow U.S. ships to stop, search, and seize vessels within the 12-mile territorial seas of South Vietnam. Another big change was uh, the in-country force got its first flag officer, Admiral, Rear Admiral Norvell G. Ward, 
And he stood up a new organiz organization called ComNav4V that not only would run or not only create TF-115, the market time uh, surveillance force, but also TF-116, which was the river patrol force, and TF-117, which was the uh, amph amphibious assault force, the riverine amphibious assault force. Admiral, Admiral Ward was an interesting guy. Uh, U.S. Navy, uh, Naval Academy class of 1935. He was a sub submariner by trade and a Navy Cross recipient from World War II uh, from his command of Guardfish. However, he did have some surface experience. He commanded the Yarnell DD 541 in Korea. Admiral Ward established this system of bar this barrier system along the 1,200 miles coastline of South Vietnam. The outer barrier consisted of both an air and, and surface component. The air component uh, was particularly crucial. This is, is a picture of an SB2H Neptune. Air surveillance, uh, these planes like the Neptune had, had a 4, 000, over 4,000 mile range. They, they carried a radar that had a 200 mile range. And once planes like this and also the P-3s were deployed, uh, almost no initial detections were made by surface ships. Almost all initial detections of infiltrators were made by the, by the uh, air surveillance. Assisting the air barrier was a, an outer barrier surface force consisting of MSOs and, and uh, DERs and the Navy was going smaller, so these are smaller ships. The outer barrier was 15 to 40 miles from the coast, and uh, nine patrol areas, each eight, eight to 80 to 120 miles long, and each patrol area was the responsibility of either a radar picket escort or a minesweeper. The main job of this barrier was to detect not engage, although some of these ships did engage once a, an infiltrator got within 12 miles of the coast. There was a middle barrier, 15, 10 to 15 miles from the coast, consisting of the VNN. And Admiral Ward, uh, during his first six weeks, visited every unit in the Vietnam Navy. And he said, quote, one thing became readily apparent to me during those, those weeks was that the Vietnamese Navy, with the exception of the Coastal Force and the River Assault Forces, had been dormant. They were not doing a thing. The Vietnamese Navy, with all its pro problems, sat back and let us take over market time patrol offshore. Well, that's true, but they did have problems. And what market time and, and the other naval task forces did is it gave the VNN, the VNN some, ta some breathing space to develop its officer corps, to develop, to, to maintain its ships, to learn how to operate its ships, so that during the Zumwalt era in the late 60s, they were much better prepared to take over. And they did a fine job during the latter part of the war up until the, you know, up until nearly the end. The inner barrier. Uh, this is, the inner barrier was patrolled by two types of boats, well really three, the coastal force was still operating, but for the Navy, there were, there were two types of boats, Coast Guard WPBs, and this is a, an 82 footer, this is Point Slocum. The job of these boats was to intercept large infiltrators, steel hulled junks and steel hulled freighters. These boats, these Coast Guard cutters, were larger than the swift boats. Swift boats were 50 feet, these were 82 feet. They were slower, they could only, crew, they could only steam at 18 knots versus 28 knots. Uh, however, they were, cap they were much more capable for longer patrols. They, they could patrol up to four days versus PCFs, which could only patrol usually 24 hours at a time. They were also seaworthy in 35 knot winds and 15 to 20 foot seas. During high sea states, PCFs couldn't go out uh, because they, uh, there were 
several instances of PCFs being swamped uh, by rogue waves. Armament consisted of 50 caliber machine guns and a piggyback 81 millimeter 50 caliber machine gun. The 81 millimeter mortar was a, an amazingly effective weapon, uh, not only against steel hold freighters, but it could provide illumination, and later in the war uh, off offered naval gunfire support to American and Vietnamese units on the shore, and Marines would often request uh, market time naval gunfire support because they knew these guys could get get to a position, get to a location quickly, and that they, that they were extremely skilled with the weapon, which is very interesting. The other boat, as I mentioned, was the PCF, and this is an example of the Navy acquiring essentially off-the-shelf technology. This was a boat designed by, by Stuart Seacraft of Berwick, Louisiana. It was designed to get crews out to oil uh, rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And it was a high-speed boat. It could go 28 knots. And it, it had a shallow draft, only 3.5 feet of water. So it was good not only on coasts, but on major rivers. And it had similar armament, 50 caliber machine guns and that twin 81 millimeter 50 caliber gun. OK. Coastal Squadron 1, the, the, the umbrella unit that was established to command the PCFs was Coastal Squadron 1. We're very fortunate here tonight to have the first CO of Coastal Squadron 1, uh, Captain Ismay, then Commander Ismay. And a couple things about, about Coastal Squadron 1. There were numerous challenges that, that Ismay confronted, um, starting with basing. Vietnam has a long coast, but it doesn't have, it didn't have very many adequate ports for maritime forces. So what the Navy had to do was dredge in, in many cases. And this is a picture of Cat Low. And um, it was built mainly with dredging. It had no potable water. Uh, sailors initially at places like this had to live in tents. The Swifts the Swiss eventually built five separate divisions at Antoy, Da Nang, Catlow, Cameron Bay, and Quinon. Anton, Antoy, Cameron Bay, and Da Nang became the major repair facilities. And 14 to 20 PCFs were stationed at each base. Sea basing was also employed, uh, not only for market time. They, they used uh, Krishna and YFNB. 21 or two boats that were used for, for sea basing in market time, but also later on for the for TF-116 where LSTs were brought in and um, TF-117 when, when they used the YRBMs, non-self-propelled barges. The market time also set up what uh, coastal surveillance centers and these were stationed along the coast of Vietnam. And they provided a command and control and intelligence fusion function. You had Vietn Vietnamese and, and American naval personnel working in these surveillance centers. And this greatly, um, greatly improved coordination between the various barriers. PCFs had vulnerabilities, as, did, as were the WPBs, uh, to, they were not armored, and so small arms, 50 caliber, uh, machine gun fire, and rockets could prove devastating if they managed to hit one of these boats. Uh, Commander Ismay had to deal with some losses initially. Uh, PCF-4 was hit by, was destroyed by a command detonated mine on a river. PCF-41, and this is uh, Commander Ismay with the crew of, some of the crew of PCF-41, including uh, Lieutenant Alexander, later Captain Alexander Balian. Uh, Balian's boat was hit by a 105 millimeter fin-stabilized rocket fired from a Chinese rocket launcher. 
the, the PCF also suffered from seaworthiness problems. PCF 77 on 15 November 19, 1966, while trying to rescue a, a man overboard from, P, from PCF 22, was hit by a ro rogue wave and overturned. Three people were killed. The sailor from PCF 22 survived. In all, 51 sailors on swift boats were lost during the war. But the, the operation as a whole was a tremendous success. Um, this is a map showing the 12 major trawler intercepts of the war. Market time just about eliminated steel-hulled freighters and other ocean-going junk infiltration into Vietnam. Of course, smaller wooden junks and sampans still could get through, but anything metal couldn't get through. And as Mark Moyer, a historian with the Marines, has, has found in researching North Vietnamese documents, this, this really had an impact on logistics for the Viet Cong. Uh, up, up until market time, much of the logistics was being taken care was was coming from the sea, not the land. Some of these trawler intercepts uh, became full-fledged battles. And this is a picture of the Point League, and it intercepted a trawler on 20 June 1966, and we're very fortunate to have the commander of Point League, Lieutenant Ulmer, who's going to discuss this particular incident in more detail. Late in the war, or in 1967, that's still the middle of the war, the Navy sent over Asheville-class patrol gunboats to Vietnam. Uh, the Asheville-class was a, really a revolutionary uh, ship for its time. It, it was the first ship to employ ga uh, gas turbine technology. It had two diesel engines and a gas turbine. And the, the diesel engines were for cruising and for sprinting. It could sprint up to 37 knots. That's when the, the, the turbine engine was employed. It had a fiberglass deck house for low radar signature. It was 165 feet long, 8.5, and it only drew 8.5 feet of water. It was designed to counter the Soviet missile boat threat, but it, in, a, in a way it was tailor-made for Vietnam. They, they sent PGs without missiles uh, because the guns were, were quite adequate for, for Vietnam. It, um, they did suffer mechanical problems, but when they worked, as Admiral Robinson will discuss, uh, they were tremendous, uh, tremendously effective. Why was market time so effective? It was blockades are something the Navy does well today, did well in the Civil War, and uh, certainly did well during the Cold War. This is this is. Uh, this is really part of the core competency of a Navy, and anything made of steel could not get through. Uh, another reason for the success of Mark Time were aggressive junior officers, uh, like Steve Ulmer here and, and Admiral Robinson, and excellent coordination between US, US units, and also a, a superb enlisted force Enlisted had to volunteer twice. Uh, they had to volunteer for the Navy or the Coast Guard, and then they had to volunteer for Vietnam. Now, a few will tell you they were voluntold to go to Vietnam, but, <clears throat> but most were, were true volunteers. And people from, people from all different ratings entered the, entered the, the Navy. Uh, this is a picture of commissaryman, second class William Kepler of the Point Grey, shaking hands with the CEO, um, Charles Mosier, and he was a commissaryman, yet he served on small boats, and you had signalmen and, and, and radiomen and, and all sorts of different types, and it was an opportunity to step out of the traditional career path, uh, whether you're an officer or enlisted, and do something different. Unfortunately, by stepping out of that career path, some officers' careers were negatively impacted later on in the war, uh, later on in their careers, but, um, 
but many found it a great adventure, and there, were, there was no shortage of volunteers. It's a picture of Steve Ulmer. TF-115 was, was really the bow wave of a massive buildup of naval force in South Vietnam. Three task forces were eventually established. More than 174,000 sailors served, over 350 patrol vessels, as well as barrack ships, maritime patrol aircraft, helicopter gunships, and special forces. And if you're interested, Naval Her History and Heritage Command has published this book, War in the Shallows. It's available online for free, and I have the URL, cards with the URL, that I can give people if they want after the presentation. Thank you very much. Steve. Well, good evening. And they say, uh, he, he said that uh, commissary men are uh, volunteered. Well, clergymen also. That's, that's me. Uh, oh, there we go. Well, good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And I want to thank the Naval Heritage Command and the Surface Navy Association for the privilege of representing, and that's what I see I'm doing, representing all of the brave Coast Guard personnel who served in Operation Market Time. It's, it's a real privilege. That's the patch of uh, Coast Guard Squadron 1 uh, <clears throat> in Vietnam. Uh, on the bottom, I wrote down uh, Semper Paratus. That's the Coast Guard motto, which means always ready, always ready to, be, to go out uh, for search and rescue, always ready for the changing demands uh, and roles that are placed upon the Coast Guard, and al always ready to take a search and rescue vessel like the 82-foot uh, patrol boat in the United States, put more armament on it, paint it gray, and send it over there, and it did quite well. Uh, my friend and classmate, Roger Beaving, who's on the front table, met, had a model made. It's up here to, to uh, your right on the stage. You can come and look at it, and uh, 450 caliber machine guns aft, and then that piggyback. That piggyback thing was the, that's the greatest invention since raisin bread, I thought. It was really, it was fantastic to how we, uh, we uh, uh, use that thing, but this is uh, back to a picture that Dr. Sherwood showed just to align you with what I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to try to explain in a few minutes what consumed about 12 hours or more of our time. So uh, with your permission, I'll talk fast if you listen fast, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll go through that. So the day before, uh, that guy that's he's grounded, he didn't make his destination, and he's on fire. Uh, that's what he looked like. Uh, he was photographed by a reconnaissance uh, plane about 80 miles away. Uh, we would get better as the war went on in, in gathering information and intelligence, knowing what we're looking for, knowing to keep tracking it. All we had was this is where we saw it then, and there was no continual tracking. There were some holes in the, in the net, which would get tighter and tighter. By the, uh, by the end of the war. That guy looks innocent, but his, uh, the netting is covering three gun mounts, two amidships and one on the, the stern, which he, he uh, brought the guns out when it was time for him to defend himself. So that dude thought he was gonna make it into the Cochin River on our watch, and we said, no way. Uh, I was commanding the Point League. Uh, we didn't know when and where, or it would be him, but, uh, a little before 3 a.m. in the morning on the 20th of June, uh, we get this, uh, uh, you know, radar. You get a bigger image when it's uh, steel hull. Uh, we got closer. He was going about six knots and uh, about eight miles off the coast. We got within two miles, flashing light uh, signal uh, several times. I'm a patient guy, you know, uh, given the benefit of the doubt. We really didn't know. Then we get within five or 600 yards uh, of it. We've got a really nice searchlight. And bingo, there it is, big green hull guy. And uh, he had a junk alongside that we, must, we missed in our radar, and it was obvious probably his pilot to take him into the river and into uh, that area. Well, he immediately, we could see the white water on the stern. Uh, you know, full speed for him was only 12 knots. We fired some warning shots across the bow, and he didn't respond. So to maintain tactical advantage, I turned the light out, obviously. Uh, swung around. Uh, we're not real fast, but we were faster than him, so we can <laughs> keep up. Uh, swung around on the other side, came up on, the, on his port side at about five or 600 yards. 
hit the searchlight again, and I made up my mind. It says, well, if he doesn't respond to the, our warning shots again, we're going to just shoot at him. I didn't have to make that decision because as soon as we start, we, uh, we surprise him, and we have a siren on that too, you know, like the cops are coming. It must have been fun there. I, I had fun pushing that button. Anyway, we're, uh, if cops are here, you're not going to make it. Uh, so uh, we, we, we do the, uh, the burst of 50 caliber, and he cut loose, and there we go, there we go, you know, firefight. I found out I'm allergic to bullets. I really don't like them uh, <laughs> over there. But anyway, then, you know, some come through the pilot house and only a couple of minor injuries, and, and they're all going kind of high. And I read, oh, yeah, he's, cert he's shooting at the searchlight up there. And he had, they, they were using the equivalent to 50 caliber. Their um, a tracer was like big golf balls coming at us. So um, I turned the searchlight out. It says, we can do this by illumination. And he actually headed for the beach, and shortly after that, he... he uh, he hit the beach, you know, he, he ground it out. But we would use the mortar for uh, illumination flare, and then we'd shoot mortar and, and flare and shoot uh, until he stopped. And it didn't take him too long. Once he hit the beach, he, um, uh, they got off. And, you know, we couldn't quite see from that distance people. But uh, when he stopped shooting, we realized, well, okay, we've got him, but we don't have his, his cargo yet, so we're going to keep illuminating till daybreak. Uh, it'd sure be nice to have some other folks in on this. Well, before, uh, it didn't take long, and the Air Force sent in a helicopter gunship and fired some um, rounds of some uh, rockets into him, and then the, the dragon ship, Puff the Baggage Dragon, with their uh, uh, Gatlin guns, you know, 2,000 rounds a minute, and it was, we could see it was like rain on the water with their, um, uh, with, with the flares. Well, I found out who called that in because... Uh, uh, Point Slocum, who was a WPB in the next area, one of my classmates, uh, he heard he wanted to come to the hear, heard about this fracas going on down here, and so he headed down our way to help us out. And he called me on the FM, uh, which is line of sight. Uh, it was another transmitter we had, and and he said, "Hey, Steve, uh, did you know that your mic was depressed and you've been transmitting constantly for about 45 minutes to an hour?" Now this was the next thing. Th Let me go back here. This is. That guy on the right, he's the culprit. Um, you know, you know the, <laughs> you're know, you not supposed to drive and talk on your cell phone unless you have an ear, uh, ear set. And uh, so they're talking to me, the Coastal Surveillance Center, while I'm chasing this guy and we're shooting and commence firing. And, and, and they keep asking questions. And I, I, so I told Ensign Tung, and you see, you know, I'm only 5'7". I said, you answer them. Just tell them we're busy. I'll call back. Well, I didn't watch this, but he took the mic, which is about like this, it has a little button on the bottom to hang it on a bracket up high. And he couldn't reach it. I wasn't watching. And, uh, and he stuck it upside down in an empty coffee cup that was on the console, and it depressed the mic key. And so the co it must have been entertaining but also uh, alarming. And so they, they called the posse out without me having to do that because they, uh, uh, after the hearing all set, you know, and I was saying, commence firing, cease firing, go get them. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like a cheerleader. I'm telling them, go for it. And, uh, and they're hearing me, and they can hear the muffled sounds of the 50 caliber in the background. So that was, you know, free entertainment. But it was really telling them what was going on. It wasn't intentional, but it was a providential mistake. Point, uh, Point Slocum came in to help us. And at, shortly after daybreak, uh, actually, a, it was a scuttling charge, we believe, on the in the uh, pilot house, a little explosion. It started a fire in the after hole. It became, uh, the small arms were cooking off and going out about 50, 75 feet. And, uh, you know, like little firecrackers, uh, the, you know, could have gotten a little bigger and it could have gone sky high. We wanted to come in and put the fire out, but uh, we uh, realized quickly that the people that got off uh, the boat alive uh, didn't want us to get their prize, plus other VC in the area, so we, the, fire, the fight went to the shore. Uh, our gunners were pretty good, uh, very sharp in, in stopping their shooting, but we didn't feel like it was right for us to come alongside that and put the fire out while we're shooting at people at the same time. Just not a not too good a deal. So these uh, um, two coastal group junks came. That's like the Vietnamese Coast Guard. And uh, uh, we had the bright idea with our two WPBs. We Each WPB, two volunteers, they got on board the junks with, uh, we had these uh, portable fire extinguishers, fire, fire hoses, fire thing, water hoses. 
Uh, and uh, so while uh, Point Slocum and Point Lee were doing covering north and south on the beach here, we were drawing some fire and, and but keep, we were keeping those guys busy while the fire kept these people busy here. Um, and they cooled it down and the uh, small arms stopped cooking off to the point to where they could go on board. That's my engineman. Uh, those guys that went on board and did that, those guys got bronze stars out of that and they deserved every, every bit of it. Point Slocum com coming up on the right here. We got the fire out, I think, around 1300, about 1, 1 p.m. Uh, there it is with the fire out. You can see one of the rocket holes on the side there. The USS Tortuga. Now, there are a lot of other units that were listening in. It was at LSD uh, not too far away. They sent in a couple of uh, landing craft with damage control parties. They helped to finish putting out the fire, taking uh, all of the arms off. It's estimated 100 tons. Um, putting them, uh, you don't see a cop picture of their... Uh, craft, but it's on, to the right of this. Uh, we, uh, uh, and there were uh, the Haverfield, there was a bunch of units involved ultimately. That's uh, broken down the 12.7 uh, millimeter machine gun, uh, equivalent to 50 caliber, uh, armor piercing incendiary bullets that they were using. The incendiary light up the, light up the whole um, pilot house, uh, stole, stole my night vision. That's a uh, recoilless rifle found on the stern. I'm glad they didn't use that on us. It could be a different story for me uh, right now. And then, uh, uh, oh, this, thing, this thing's really happy tonight. Um, my uh, quartermaster, uh, first class, he, he uh, convinced me to raise the uh, American flag on that ship. That's the yard arm of that ship we captured. Uh, it's our property, that's what we said. <laughs> and then we raised, uh, uh, lifted up a, uh, a broom on the yard of the uh, arm of the Point League, at least until we got to port after that. Uh, this is the Dream Team, and that's the Navy Unit Commendation Medal that they got. Um, eight out of the 11, I don't know where the others were, but uh, they were super. I would not be here to give this talk if they did not do their job as well as they did. They, they were excellent. But the team was even bigger than that. See, it's a whole team thing. That's my, I guess that's my, my theme is uh, I counted the different units involved, the Haverfield, the Tortuga, the Viet Coastal Junk, and then the Vietnamese Army came in. Oh, Air Force also, they came in and strafed the area to clean the area out. Uh, it, 12, 11 or 12 units. Uh, it's teamwork. That's what it is. And so at the end of the day, when we're going off in the sunset, I think this is just uh, Another example uh, of Coast Guard living up to our motto, Semper Paratus. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I, I'm here to uh, represent uh, somehow the uh, uh, other activity along the coast. It was with a group of swift boats. Uh, we started out uh, in uh, October of uh, 65. Uh, the Coast Guard was already there. And uh, we had a job to do uh, one of them was to get out and start intercepting and searching junks. And the other one was to increase from two swift boats to 84 as they were coming off the assembly line in Louisiana. So uh, my own responsibility was to get the swift boats organized, the crews trained, uh, and the do's and do nots of a small boat operation. Um, the, uh, the activity uh, that I'm referring to was uh, involved training of the PCFs, outfitting them, signaling back to our home base, which is Coronado, California, with the amphibious group, uh, signaling back our needs, signaling to three or four different major commands in the Navy 
about our requirements to change the boats to modify them. Some of the stuff was very easy to do. I never had a problem in writing a message to get something done. Uh, one of the things that I remember was very simple was that our, we had an air scoop in the bow of the boat near the superstructure, and we wanted to raise that up because it was too close and we're getting unnecessary waters coming into the boat through the uh, ventilation system. Um, but uh, in addition to, the, to making modifications to the boat, it was necessary for us to feedback to the training command in uh, Coronado, California, uh, what the syllabus should include for training our swift crews as they came over. Um, so there was a lot of work that I had to do that it was continuous. Uh, I won't say it was day and night, it was mostly daytime. Uh, and uh, we had to prepare to close out the coastal surveillance work. And uh, get the squadron into a full operational unit within the next year when, it, when we had the build up of all the boats there. So uh, I'm going to sit down and ask if you have any questions about that wonderful time uh, to let us know uh, when I'm through. Thank you. Well, let me start out by thanking the uh, Surface Navy Association for giving me the opportunity to come back and see some old shipmates and old friends. And uh, I'm, I'm using that literally, I think. But, uh, but I'm really pleased to see some of our junior officers and our midshipmen with us tonight. It, it shows the strength of our community and what's going on. And it also is a group of people who will be unable to ascertain if my memory is a little faulty as, as I go through. The, um, we have been allotted time. Some of you may, may remember Admiral Wayne Meyer, the father of Aegis. I saw Wayne speak at a lot of things. Always took his watch off and put it right up on the podium to show the sincerity to stick within the time allotted. And then he ignored it for the <laughs> so, so I'll try not to, to ignore mine. Um, I came, um, the PGs came, as Dr. Sherwood uh, noted, much later in the conflict than what you've heard from Captain Ismay and Captain Ulmer. And uh, we, we're doing the, uh, the CTF-115 job of coastal surveillance. We were going over in the Gulf of Siam, and we'd go up and down uh, the coast of South Vietnam. Never saw a trawler. Never got a chance to participate like Captain Ulmer. Inspected a lot of junks, and for that, we got smelly sides. That was about it, but we never saw a junk. Uh, my combat team, I mean, never saw a trawler. My combat team woke me up one night at about 2 o'clock and told me they had one on radar and they'd been tracking him. And I said, are you sure? Yes, sir, Captain, we got him. So I go up to the bridge and we slowly and stealthily snuck up on Consign Island and, <laughs> and, and let it go. So... <laughs> I, I'm indebted to Dr. Sherwood that, that he explained what a patrol gunboat was and the armament that it, that it had and the capabilities and so forth. Uh, people tend to misunderstand PTs and PGs. And as you recall, the PTs were wooden boats, World War II, phenomenal craft. Uh, they could do 40 knots, and they could do 40 knots for about 500 miles. A uh, crew of about 15, um, and they had 50 calibers, 50 calibers and torpedoes. 
they were made famous by Admiral Buckley, JFK, and McHale's Navy. The, PG, <laughs> the PGs have never had their own TV program. I, in, instead of going through the, the, the action uh, that Dr. Sherwood mentioned uh, a moment ago, I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes and tell you what it was like to take a commissioned ship in and out of the brown water area. We were not brown water, we were, we were blue water, but we were sent in support of um, Task Force 116 uh, in, the, uh, in the Baudet Kansan rivers. Uh, Zumwalt, when Zumwalt came in, he was erecting, uh, or he did erect a um, thing called Sea Float, a floating command post in the river right off the side of the old Nam city that had been destroyed through Tet. And this command post, uh, and, and we're in the middle of Vietnamization right now, was, was uh, mutually manned by Vietnamese and Americans, and uh, they were building solid anchor on the shore. And, and the purpose was is to try and regain control of the Cao Mau Peninsula. It was just literally Indian territory. And so we were sent up the river to provide um, primarily uh, gunfire support um, to sea float. The river ran very fast. It was a three to four or five knot river. And uh, we had no business being there. Uh, we stuck up above the, uh, the foliage. Uh, when we went on turbine, which we did on occasion, uh, you could hear us all the way up to Saigon. Uh, I mean, it was nothing stealthy. Dr. Sherwood mentioned that we were fiberglass and, and, um, and uh, aluminum, but there was nothing stealthy in that river. And so we, but we, the first night I went up there, we were concerned about sappers just floating down the river. And so, so in terms from some of our previous uh, PG uh, deployments over there, uh, we went up and we anchored and we set up our defensive perimeters. We, we checked in with sea float, and then we decided we were gonna drop percussion grenades every 15 minutes um, to preclude sappers getting close to us. And so we got all this set up, and, and even in the middle of Vietnam, come eight o'clock, you're gonna have a movie down in the, down in the ship's mess. And so uh, we got everything set up, and I go down to watch the movie, and I'm leaning back in my chair, and I swear, I thought we had been hit with a cannon. The ship shook, and it was loud, and I, and I went running up to the, to the top side, and I grabbed this young man, uttered a couple of explicitives that I don't remember right now, and I said, throw it. Don't drop it. <laughs> There was, a, there was a petty officer standing and he said, Captain, he said, I watched him. He threw it as hard as I can. I said, I don't believe you, you watch him again. So I went down to watch my movie and, and of course, he threw it as hard as he can. I had no idea how the crew was gonna sleep, but sleep we did and, and the hand grenades really didn't, didn't bother us. Um, for those of you who grew up in my era, the ship handling book was Crenshaw and Crenshaw it's a wonderful book, but when you go alongside um, or when you're doing a restricted maneuvering, Crenshaw would, would outline how the conning officer would control both the engines and, and the searageway. Uh, and there was one little paragraph in, in, in there that I recall about, well, you could have one guy on the throttles and one guy on the helm, and I thought to myself at the time, Ensign Robinson said to himself, I believe that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But on a PG, you did not have that capability to stand on the wing and monitor your engines and your steerageway. And the engines were not like on an old destroyer where you could control the RPMs. They were really ticklish. Dr. Sherwood mentioned we had um, uh, a, a really sophisticated engineering system, but but, but it did not have the gauges and the, and the sophistication to give you control of those engines. We went up and down the river with 
steering by Siemens I. Seaman, Seaman Deuce, maybe a third class bosun mate, kept that ship in the middle of the river. That was all they had to do, keep it in the middle of the river. And then the conning officer uh, controlled the speed. And we'd go up and down that river periodically on, on a turbine, and we did it a couple of times at night. And I don't remember what they called them. They were aluminum cylinders, they were flares, and you popped off one end and shoved it down there and it fired off the flare. That's how we would go down the river, firing those flares so that the seaman, <laughs> steering by seaman eye, could see where he was headed. We, um, in, the, in the action that Dr. Sherwood mentioned, one, one of the things is I get an, an, an awful lot of publicity over the years uh, for having been awarded an award. Uh, it's not well known. There was another Navy Cross awarded for that same action. It was a Lieutenant Steve Herbert who did not stay in the Navy uh, long. He went down to the Tidewater area. He has been a um, uh, city manager for several of the uh, communities down there. Over half the crew received Purple Hearts, and then there were numerous other uh, awards to crew members for that same action. Um, I went through, the ship went through maybe three or four firefights. Um, we did a lot of firing of our own. And throughout that entire time, there were tugboats from Louisiana who were hauling sand up the river for the, for the construction of solid anchor. Now, in the Navy, you're always going to have movies. Turns out in Louisiana tugboats, you're always going to have steaks. We ate well, and they got to see a lot of movies. And so, <laughs> so the, the, um, the business of a commission ship operating in the Brownwater Navy is, is not well understood even today because it was a, sort of a rare uh, occurrence, uh, but it was an exciting time uh, in my career and um, uh, a lot of stories that get better and better every year. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sherwood and our, our panelists for coming tonight. I appreciate all of you coming. And uh, if anyone's got any questions, we have a couple minutes. If you'd like a question for any of the panelists. Sea stories. The coordination between the swift boats and people on the shore the co coordinate, coordination between the swift boat and other boats out there, the Coast Guard, these were all really accomplished through radio transmissions to what was called a coastal surveillance station. And there were a group of those sprinkled along the, the, the coastline. I don't know if that's answering your question, but I hope it does. Those those surveillance centers performed a C2 function that didn't exist previously, and uh, they were instrumental in some of the, they're, 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 uh, they are unsung heroes. They were instrumental in some of the intercepts. And there were v VNN officers as well as USN participating, so you could coordinate not only between US services, but also uh, with the Vietnamese. What year was I there? Yes, uh, Dr. Sherwood's uh, piece takes you to 68, uh, uh, I recall. And I'm uh, trying to recall uh, uh, Sea Float and Solid Anchor were uh, well, late 68, was it? And, I, I was there. I do not know when it was established. I think it was established by Zumwalt when he came over to BNAF 4 V. Um, but I was there in the summer of 70. 70. And uh, Solid Anchor still had a way to go. Uh -huh. 
And, I mean, that your description of uh, tugs bringing barging sand up for solid anchor through uh, through a, a kill a kill zone. So it strikes me as uh, how did you how did we get the uh, I guess these were civilian crews on the tugs, right? With they, MSC. they were civilian crews, and I was in a firefight, and I had to move over towards the starboard side of the river because here came a, a tug with tow, <laughs> and so. When I got back to sea float, I went over there, and and in so many words, I said WTH, yeah. and he said, he said, well, number one, I can't stop, and he said, number two, I get a hundred dollars every time I get hit. And so, <laughs> so, so the free market works. Right. Well, I mean, we had some really brave guys, and and there were some. Uh, uh, you know, obviously some civilians who were either brave or stupid or both, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. the, dred the dredging and, crew. And so just a, another, another piece, uh, about the time you were operating, I, as I recall, Admiral Zumwalt had the uh, SEALs, UDT guys, uh, trying to flood the zone down there as well. Is that correct? Were you, uh, there, were they operating there, off of sea float and then the, going There were SEALs operating, the sea float was Primarily Navy operators, SEALs, VNN, and uh, SWIFT boats. And uh, one of the things was is that I went to the nightly briefing over there, and then one time I came back and was berated for having pinned down two of our SWIFT boats that had made an excursion on the on the side of the river. Uh, and I said, did. Anyone mention that in the briefing last night that they would be there? And they say, well, no, we didn't mention that. And I said, For, forewarned, because, I mean, it was any time something happened on, on, the, uh, on that foliage over there, I was going to shoot back. And so sort of, as Captain Ulmer mentioned a, a moment ago, you sort of have a reflex to do that. So that's what was assigned to sea float. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Admiral, having uh, joined our Navy in the early 70s, I'm, I'm reflecting back on what it must have been like over there in Vietnam, and I'm wondering, you were probably running around darkened ship, with you know all your nav lights off, et cetera. Thank God for the traffic separation scheme of those three tiers, but I'm wondering, you know, did all those WPBs and uh, the swift boats, did they all have a surface search radar on them? Or was your primary sensor, uh, the Mark I Mod Zero, uh, set of eyeballs and binoculars at night with, a, with an alert uh, set of lookouts? Um, communications, I think I heard, were, were VHF, uh, FM, radio. Uh, so you didn't have much range to do surface, let alone, you know, there was, probably wasn't a subsurface threat, but triple SC coordination. And uh, also the aspect of navigation along a long, dark coastline where you probably had a pathometer to monitor your depth or so, but uh, no lighthouses, I'm sure, along that light, long coastline. And uh, we didn't have NTDS out there on those platforms. Uh, you didn't have GPS Garmin as the kids, the millennials now use to know where the hell you were. And so was it all DR the whole time being vigilant? So just if you would address the question. Well, if you have a difficult question, come back after we'll. <laughs> it, it was a different time. Triple SC was, was in the future. Um, the, the WPBs, uh, I think I heard 11 crewmen. I had 18 crewmen. I had one each of everything except I had, uh, I think, four five uh, engine men, is that? Um, and, and so your, your radarman couldn't be on duty the whole time and your, and your um, uh, radio men could not be on duty the whole time. And so quite frankly, distance was comfort. And so I stayed off the coast when I was uh, at night. And, and that's why we snuck up on Kansan Island. If you take a look, it's quite a, quite a ways off the coast. 
I don't know about, but I'll, I'll answer another party. To my knowledge, everything out there, except maybe the PBRs or something, had a surface search radar of some, some degree. But again, that didn't work with wooden sand pans and things of that nature, so you know, they, they were probably pop-up targets in close. The, they, they could be pop-up targets, but, but, but you come into a different mindset. Uh, in today's Navy, you want to avoid at all costs hitting some other ship. Um, in, in a war zone like that, uh, it, it's hard to say, but, but hitting a sandpan was the least of my, my worries. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, um, hi, I'm, I'm Captain Bob Fenton. I'm a retired Coast Guard captain. And in fact, I'm a classmate of Steve Ulmer, so uh, we have a lot of things in common we've talked about over the years. I just wanted to not ask a question, but just make a little statement that first I wanted, I wanted to thank the, uh, the Surface uh, Association for inviting and having a Coast Guard person come in and talk and contribute to it. Uh, I just also want to say that I, I wasn't in Vietnam, but I have had the pleasure of working with the Navy in several different times and also went to the Naval Postgraduate School. And I just want to let the people of the Navy know that the uh, Coast Guard is very proud and happy to be able to work with the Navy. Uh, we kind of think of the Navy as our big brothers in many ways, and we look forward to their help, but also their counsel and things that they do for us. So we're very pleased and ha happy for the Coast Guard. I think for all Coast Guard, I'm saying that, that's I think all of us feel that way. And, just want to thank you for it. And that's part of the reason why I got this cake here, to kind of thank those Navy people that, that have done everything I've done for the Coast Guard and for our country, and we're proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to add to that. Uh, a little known historical fact is that the Coast Guard has participated in every single war uh, along with the Navy since 1812. Uh, sometimes it's a small contingent, but uh, we've been there. Uh, under the radar, but we're there to to help Big Brother. You may be uh, fighting the giant, but we're kicking his shin at the same time. Uh, can I add something too? Uh, it wasn't mentioned in our events here we talked about, but if you read Dr. Sherwood's book, the PCFs were involved with several of the other trawler intercepts working together with other units. So uh, sometimes they were the very first responders. I should add that the Coast Guard was also involved in aids to navigation. They actually um, installed, installed buoys at key locations along the coast. While so being shot at. While being shot at. <laughs> like the tugs. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up now, but I want to just quickly recognize our participants. Um, to Dr. Sherwood from the Surface uh, Navy Association, we wish to express great appreciation for your devotion to the preservation of our naval heritage and history. We are honored by your scholarship and diligence in the pursuit of historical fact and excellence. Your insights and presentation of the historic market time operations at our annual symposium is both respected and appreciated with our highest esteem. Your expertise on the subject and dynamic presentation of the facts painted a clear picture of the event and its importance in the annals of the naval history. Thank you for honoring us with your talk. Bravo Zulu for a job well done. Signed, Barry McCullough, Vice Admiral, U.S. Navy, retired, President, Surface Navy Association. For, for Mr. Olmer, Reverend Olmer, demonstrated his valor, determination, leadership, and for this, the Surface Navy Association proudly recognizes you as a representative of the numerous young Coast Guard officers and sailors who fought and sacrificed during this historic and vital operation on the vast South, South Vietnam coastline against the North Vietnamese gun running waters. Signed, Vice Admiral Barry McCullough, retired President of the SNA. Thank you. Captain Ismay, the Surface Navy Association applauds your leadership and contributions in this historic and vital operation of the vast South Vietnam coastline and against the North Vietnamese gun running trailers. Signed, Barry McCullough, Vice Admiral, U.S. Navy, President, Surface Navy Association.
For Vice Admiral uh, Robinson, by his extraordinary courage, resolute fighting spirit, and inspiring personal example in the face of a fierce enemy attack, Lieutenant Commander Robinson upheld the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service, and for this, we recognize you on behalf of all the officers who served during market time operations in the Vietnam War. Signed, Barry McCullough, Vice Admiral, U.S. Navy, retired, President of the Surface Navy. Service. One final note, uh, someone left a pair of glasses on this front table. If you're missing them, they're right there. And with that, we'll close. Again, thank you for coming tonight, and thanks again, Raytheon, for sponsoring this event. Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you, Captain. Yeah, look forward to it.